Before we get started, support for this show comes from Boulder Strategic Consulting. You can drive your business strategy with a digital plan that unites and engages your team. Boulder Strategic Consulting can bridge the gap between your technology and marketing departments. You need insights to inspire business transformation. Boulder will empower you to thrive in a digital world. You don't have to stress out about your digital transformation projects anymore. Let Boulder Strategic Consulting come in and help you and your team reach success. Find out more at boulderstrategy.com. That's B-O-L-D-R strategy.com. How do you avoid autopiloting your life? What would life look like if you weren't operating out of fear and you opted instead to move in a more purposeful direction, one with intent? Would you hide from meeting people or get excited about the chance to learn about someone else's experience? Would you be in a rush to make the numbers or opt instead for building a relationship? From the time we're born, so many of us seem to witness a loss in our curiosity about ourselves, others, and the world around us. Why is that? Can we change it? And if so, how? For this episode of Association Chat, I had the chance to sit with Andrew Horn in his home in the Williamsburg area of Brooklyn, New York, and ask him all of this and more. Andrew's been called the Dale Carnegie for the digital age, and so we talked about curiosity, meaningful conversations, social flow, and his thoughts about community. I really enjoyed talking with Andrew, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Moroccan Oasis for the second time today. We are glad you are here. Yes, yes. <laughs> By the way, none of these ever start like that. So it's kind of exciting that we get a I chance to do my, it this way. I got my Jafar. <laughs> you are here. <laughs> welcome. Yes. Um, welcome. And, and thank you, by the way. We are doing this from your home. So thank you for letting me in, Andrew, to, to uh, interrogate, interview, talk with you. It's so much fun. You have such great energy and beautiful oh, family. So welcome you. to our home. We, we love inviting this type of energy into the space and filling it with love and insights and curiosity and all that good stuff. I love curiosity. You're, you're mentioning all kinds of words that I already have an affinity for. So I'm glad that I'm glad we get to do this. So Likewise. I have to say that all of this started with an index card and a name on it, which is kind of perfect. I'm going to let that be a mystery for you guys. But what I want to do is I want to start and talk about the mystery that is Andrew, because what I'm going to say is that from reading about you mm. and the different companies and projects that you have um, connected with you, one could think that they're very different, they're very separate. But what I would like for you to do is maybe, you know, give me, give us all um, an idea of how they're connected. So, can you talk to me about? these different projects that you have going on and maybe what the through line is. Because I've got my idea, yeah. but I'm not Andrew. You know, the, the through line of everything that I've done in my career, and this is everything from adaptive athletics, helping tens of thousands of young people with disabilities to play sports in Washington, D.C., to dreams or to tribute, you know, helping yeah. you know, hundreds of thousands of people to share these collaborative video montages telling people why they love them and appreciate them um and to my speaking and writing with mm -hmm. social flow and the argument of conversation the through line through all of this is meaningful human connection mm -hmm. of how can we create community how can we create constructs how can i create technology that facilitates meaningful communication and deeper connection and you know i think that for so much of my life, I, I love the idea of a, of a calling mm -hmm. being looking at where you struggle in your life. Mm -hmm. And then as you grow older, as you develop new skills, how do you take what you now know, what you're good at to then support people who are going through those similar challenges? And right. for me, you know, I grew up as a shy, lonely white kid as a minority in a uh, Hawaiian school and was bullied and felt lonely growing up. And I think that so much of what drives why I do this is because I, 
I basically have I felt the experience of being like alone. Oh and wow! I, and I just wow. didn't, and so I'm, I wow. just know what that feels like, yeah. how unpleasant that is. And so you know, anytime I can I can build technology that that brings people together, anytime I can create events that allows young people with disabilities to get off the sidelines and and connect with their peers, anytime I can create frameworks that helps people to be more embodied and comfortable in social situations. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I feel I feel goosebumps as I talk about that because that's that that I feel like is a calling of mine is that I get to help people to transcend those challenges that I myself have experienced. Wow. Yeah. So, um, can do you mind if I dig into that a little Please bit? Please do. More? Okay. Yeah, take it away. <laughs> so, um, so when you were experiencing bullying and when you were feeling isolated and alone. Did that, did you ever go through a period of time where you were just like, I just don't want community. I I'm pushing, I'm pushing back. I, maybe I don't need it. Maybe I'm good. Maybe I'm better by myself. Hmm. Did you ever do that? Because I feel like sometimes there are people who, um, maybe that's the, the approach they take. They don't want me. I don't want them. I don't need other people. So is that, did you ever do that? Or did you, did you always know, uh, they're not my my tribe. They're not my people, but I will find my people eventually. You know, my my response to not having a real tribe growing yes. up was I had an opportunity to move from Hawaii to Washington, Washington D.C. when I was 14. And I was aware that I was unhappy at mm-hmm. 13. And so I wasn't so conscious of this insight in the moment. But retrospectively, when I look back on it, it it's pretty clear and powerful of just I realized that I was unhappy and that if I didn't change something drastically, Mm -hmm. I was going to continue to be unhappy. And so for me, that was, I need to go and be social. I need to have friends and try that out. And so my response was almost the opposite of like, okay, so I was unhappy as this lonely, solitary person in life. And so then I almost over-rotated and then my (laughs) de facto became, um, I wanted to belong so badly that so much of my being then became okay, so what are the other kids doing? Mm-hmm. How can I say the thing? How can I be the person that I want other people to be? And I think that so many of us have that experience when we're coming of age is that we just want to belong. We want right. to be a part of the group is that we develop this, this validation seeking behavior. And for a lot of us, like, we don't transcend that for our entire lives mm-hmm. is that we, we do the thing, we say the thing that we think is going to get the external result. And um, you know, I did that for a lot of my life. And it it is on the surface effective Mm -hmm. to a point, you know, you can appease people, you can please people and that can work. But what I care about is how do you help people to tap into like the power of their authentic selves? How do you help them to connect with who they really are so they can build relationships that feed their soul on a surface level? Yeah. So that's been really the evolution of my work of, you know, from really kind of struggling to feel confident in social situations so then learning how to force my way into those relationships to then in business of learning that you know I could learn the communication techniques of storytelling of persuasion of how to ask the right question and that that stuff could achieve external results but ultimately what I've come back to is that the way that we really unlock our power with people is by developing a better relationship with ourselves Mm -hmm. it's by harnessing these internal forces of of authenticity, of curiosity, of intentionality. And when we learn how to, instead of focusing on external forces, seeking validation with other people, when we have that focus, which is natural and the essence of social anxiety, looking at what people think of us and how they perceive our behaviors, how do we look internally and see who we are and how I want to be in a social situation? Yeah, that's such a good, it's, it's, there are a lot of good questions there. Um, But, you know, I think it's so fascinating because we get caught up in the external. We get caught up in in worrying so much about the optics of things that we forget about underlying it. Like, why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we even having this? Why am I talking with you now? You know, like it's it's why are we here and and doing this thing? Because as I was, you know, just had the opportunity to talk with Mickey, mm-hmm. um, your partner in, in life and love, I uh, just had a chance to talk with her and, and, you know, she was talking about intentionality. And I just think that um, with so much time uh, that are so limited a time that's available to us that 
to not focus on making the most of it doesn't make much sense. And yet that's where we are. We're playing these roles. Associations are known for associating. They're known for bringing people together. Sure. And yet we lose sight, I think, in the association industry of really what's the best way to do that. And so here you are and you've been able to, you know, figure out how to help people do that in a number of different ways. So let's talk about some of those ways, if you don't mind. Um, I would love to talk a little bit about um, this. You have a group, and I don't know a whole lot about it, but it's this group of bringing men together yeah. and bringing them into community and sort of, can you explain a little bit more about that? Because I saw, I've seen some videos and I've seen like different things. And I was right. like, what is this? This is so cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so, you know, and I'm going to, I'm going to bookmark this and I'm going to answer because what you were talking about before is how we focus so much on these external forces right yes. before we got into this. Yes. And I think that one thing that's important to say about that is because people should understand that that force caring what other people think about us yeah. is one of the most natural human instincts on the planet. Yeah. And the social anxiety, the shyness that 60, 70% of all people experience yeah. is literally just it's crazy to say this, but social anxiety is a fear of death. So think about social this. Anxiety because is fear of death, right? social, anxiety, social anxiety is, is a neolithic, it's a primordial instinct that if we are ostracized by our tribe, that yes. we will get kicked out of that tribe, that we'll miss the hunt, that we won't be able to eat, that we won't have shelter. And, best dog. and so we had to care <laughs> about what other people thought of us. Right. And so this impulse was really helpful when we were dealing with very realistic external threats. But as we've evolved as a society, this impulse is now counterproductive. Yeah. It's like our brains are going to worry about what people think. So we need to now learn how to counterbalance that, which is focusing internally. And you know, now I'll we'll yeah. transition that into what this is. And so we have a group called the Junto. Yeah. And so the Junto is this community that we've created over the past year and a half that um, basically brings men together and provides a, a really safe container for them to explore and express their emotional experience is that for so many men, they're never empowered to really look in and explore some of the core emotions of fear, shame, joy, sadness, it's not considered anger, manly because or... it's not considered manly okay. because, you know, expressing something like anger is kind of dangerous. And yeah. so we don't learn how to express these emotions more masterfully. And so what we do is we've created a communication construct using uh, Gestalt communication principles that makes it easier for guys to talk about things like their relationship with money, their relationship, yeah. their sense of purpose, their relationship to themselves, and really talk about it from a place of what's happening emotionally. And so we do that. And then we also give men a, a place to talk about their identity of manness. Their mm -hmm. identity is masculine. And the reason this is important, not just for masculinity, but in terms of what we want to do in our lives is something called the identity model of change. Mm -hmm. And so the identity model of change says that as people, we do the types of things that align with the type of person we think we are. And so to, I'll give you a practical mm -hmm. example here. Okay. So let's think about this as someone who wants to lose 15 pounds, right? Mm -hmm. So that's our result. That's, that's our goal is that we want to lose 15 pounds. Yeah. So then our first instinct is to think of, okay, so what are the behaviors that are going to help me lose 15 pounds? Like and yes. so the, the behaviors are, okay, I'm not going to eat any dessert for the next uh, two months and I'm going to work out three times a week. Yeah. Great. But there's an element in this equation that we often forget. And that is our identity. That is our sense of who we are. And so if we think underneath those behaviors that we are a fat slob who's destined to be big for the rest of our lives and who doesn't have self-control, then guess what? We're going to revert back to the behaviors of eating dessert and not working out three times. Right. And so we have to wow. articulate what is the sense of self before. And for so many men, the idea of what it means to be a man has been cultivated completely subconsciously. Yeah. It's been... A societal preconditioning. It's been our relationship with our parents. It's been rites of passage, like sports and things like that. And when we have completely cultivated this sense of who we are subconsciously, it's directing how we act in the world, who we think we need to be. Right. And so what we give men an opportunity to do is to say, okay, so what do we think masculinity is on our own terms? And get to help them to create an identity that actually says, like, here's what it means to be a man, so that their behaviors are more likely to line up with who they really are, who they really wow. want to be in the world. Wow. Yeah. I just, I, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm just, let me process this for a second, because I think that's really powerful. 
And we were talking about, we were talking earlier about this testing assumptions, te being, being willing, being brave enough to say what, but why, why are things the way that they are? Do they need to be, does it make sense for things to be the way that they've always been? Sure. And when I hear you saying, what I hear you saying about Junto mm -hmm. is, is that you're giving, you're giving men a chance to establish, yeah, what does this mean for me? What is this, is this in alignment with what I think I need to be doing? Who, you know, what I think the best of being a man can be as I embody this body, right? Um, and that's kind of amazing because I feel like no matter what you're looking at, what role role you're playing in life or what you might be doing in any industry, challenging your assumptions and asking, does this make sense? Is this, is this right? Is this in alignment with what I think it needs to be? Is a question you need to be asking regularly. My question for you to follow up on that mm -hmm. is then, so I can imagine people get in alignment. I'm imagining my wanting to lose 15 pounds. It's an easy <laughs> thing to imagine. And so, uh, and then you think about the behaviors and then even you get in alignment and you think, okay, no, the, this is the kind of lifestyle. This is the kind of human I am that does this. And yet society's all around us poking. Like, like, sure. Here's what it is. Here's, and trying to reassert what it is that it means to be a man or what it is to, to be somebody who is in a, he at a healthy weight or whatever. And so um, what have you found as far as, uh, let's talk about Junto specifically, what have you found as far as um, ways to maintain and sort of support this new discovery of, of well, okay, it doesn't have to be the yeah. way it's always been. Well, you know, I think that uh, such a powerful part of this is community is being with people who facilitate these types of conversations. And what's fortunate now is that there are these types of groups that are popping up. And I yeah. really think that, you know, a lot of times people say that, you know, that they're in relationships and they've carried over from high school or from college is that yeah. they may be wanting to transition into conversations about purpose and about emotionality, but their friends may be more concerned with conversations about the game or the weather or whatever it might be. And that, if you just kind of Google, like, what are your interests? What are things that you want to talk about? And there's sites like meetup.com. There are people that are like involved in personal development groups and that yeah. being proactive in seeking out those groups where people are participating in an activity mm -hmm. that you're interested in is one of the best ways to start to build community with people that are meeting you where you're at. And so building community consciously mm -hmm. and proactively is one of the biggest things. And then I think that, you know, in terms of how to, how to really maintain this type of exploration of self. As humans, we're so good at forgetting who we are and what we've done is that because mm. we, we oftentimes judge ourselves on what we've done most recently. Yeah. And we forget about the totality of who we are and what we've done. And something that we always talk about with our guys is when we do these weekend retreats, one of my favorite exercises is this idea of, do you know who I am and what I've done? And we have every guy who sits there who talks about the type of man that they want to be in the world. And before they make that kind of declaration, and I would encourage anyone who's listening to this, like we're, we're heading into a weekend to take a moment to just do this. If you took 20 minutes and when I ask each of these men is I say, what are the moments of your life that you're most proud of? What are the relationships that you've cultivated? What are the obstacles that you've overcome? Mm -hmm. What are the things, where have you been of the greatest service to other people? And you see these guys who come up with this entire list of all these things that they've done that they never think about. Wow. Because as humans, we're conditioned to think about what we haven't done yet. What's next? Yeah. Is that that pressure that we put on ourselves is a force that drives us forward to achieve. Yeah. And what I say is that a more effective, a more sustainable force of motivation to do the things that you want is a deep down understanding that you are powerful, that you have done so much already. And we forget about that. Okay. Whoa. Okay tingles because <laughs> because okay so i uh, just recently achieved this goal that was a really big goal for me you yeah. know and it was um talking about something that means a great deal and i achieved this this goal that i had and worked very hard for and then i felt this sense of oddly i felt this sense of um almost, it's not depression but it was like <sighs> 
And now what? Right. And um, I was looking up for why am I feeling this way? You know, because I I'm confused. I should be ecstatic. And yet I'm scared. I'm I'm kind of lost and I don't know why. And it's because I was so focused on that thing that I'm like, well, what now? And what I found out was I looked at there's this summit syndrome and that sometimes like achievers, you know, they achieve this goal and then they're like, what do I do now? And immediately want to throw themselves into that next thing. And the answer is what you just mentioned. The answer is about have if you have an understanding and you're connected with that deeper purpose and that deeper meaning for what it is you're trying to achieve. Yeah. That reconnecting with that then allows you to be able to move forward and find the path to the next thing that you're supposed to do. Totally. So here's here's yeah. something that people should consider of like understanding what your values are, but there's something called the achievement complex. And okay. the achievement complex is the idea that if you are so focused on the next thing that you are going to do, yes. and you have this internal subconscious understanding that when I have that thing, I will be happy. I will be successful. I will be loved. What we need to understand is that we're not talking about this in a vacuum. So it's not just one thing. There's something in your mind that says, when I achieve this thing, something will happen and I will feel a different way. But what happens is that even if you achieve the goal, that that process is ingrained into your brain. And so it just now says, what's the next thing that I want to achieve, that I want to accomplish? Mm -hmm. And so if we're existing in this achievement complex, we'll never transcend that insecurity, that anxiety of the next thing that is supposed to be there. Okay. And one of the most helpful things that we can do to reframe this is the idea of articulating how do I want to feel in life mm -hmm. is that if we think about how do I want to feel, I want to feel connected. I want to feel joyful. I want to feel a sense of purpose. I want to be, how do I want to feel? so how do I want to feel? Because the idea of all these things, if you want to be a millionaire, if you want to build a hundred million dollar company, what is the real goal there? If not to feel, if I want to make a lot of money so that I can just feel safe, so I can feel free, so mm -hmm. I can feel loved, so I can feel admired. Once you understand what the feelings are that you desire, what happens is you make those feelings much more accessible. Mm -hmm. You can ask yourself, well, if I want to feel that way, what can I do right now? If I want to feel safe, right? If okay. I want to feel Yeah, no, I'm, and I'm trying to apply this. Just if anybody <laughs> thinks that I'm just like drifting off, no, no, no. It, I'm actually trying to apply this in my own life right now as you're talking about this. But yes. Yeah, okay. and so it's, it's a completely different way to think about life where you don't necessarily have to delay so much of what we desire because we we place all of our, our priority on these, these physical, tangible achievements. But what makes those so alluring is the perception of how that achievement will make us feel. Yeah. And we don't acknowledge that, right? Yes. It's that I want to true. accomplish this thing because of how it's going to make me feel. So when we acknowledge how we want that to make us feel, now what we do is we make it so much easier to actually do things in the present moment Oh my gosh. Okay. So I want to like, I want to feel like I'm, I'm, I am living my life's purpose. I want to feel that I am, I am having the impact I feel like to help people the way that I want to help them. Totally. And so, okay. So what's the easiest way to do that next should be like, I need to be thinking in those terms instead of thinking, I need to do X. Well, it's the idea of how do you okay, want to feel? Me. So what you just articulated is that okay. I want to feel like I'm living my purpose. Yes. Right? So yes. I want to feel like I'm living my purpose. Okay. And so now what you just identified is a way of feeling. And this, this relates so much to my work around social flow. Okay. Which is based off the principles of, of flow states. And like you all know flow states, whether you're an athlete, whether you love cooking your family a fresh meal, whether you're a writer, a dancer, it's that moment when you just come become completely present with the moment. You get mm -hmm. a focused energy to just do what needs to get done. Time slows down. We all know those moments, yeah. right? Yeah. And what they've talked about with flow research is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who's like the godfather of flow. Is he, he talks about how flow states are actually the essence of creating a happy life. Okay. And one of the biggest things that you do is that you actually focus on doing these things in the moment, the present moment, things that you enjoy doing. And that by giving yourself to those things, you end up living a happy life. You detach from the need for an external 
result down the road by doing what you just said. It's like, so if I want to feel like I'm living my purpose. Yeah. Does does this sitting across from me and interviewing me and sharing this with your friends, does this feel like you're living your purpose? Yes, it does. Yeah, except for the plant attacking you, but yes, it does. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. So, so there you go. So it's like these types of things when you understand. So if I want to feel like this, if I'm of service, then this becomes your drive and you just get to ask yourself like, oh, I'm going to so cry. Have... <laughs> okay, okay. No, but, that's so cool. But that's why, and that's why when you yeah. come in here, you have this energy that's, that's yeah. joyous and activated you know what I mean yeah and so it's again it's doing the things that we enjoy doing in the moment focusing on that moment giving ourselves to them because ultimately that's where we have control and what happens is that if we live our life that way you know what happens what happens we achieve the external success that we want with much greater ease and effortlessness Mm -hmm. Because we can do it in a couple of ways. We can focus on what we enjoy doing, on what we're called to do, on what we have energy to do in the moment, or we can focus on the next thing over and over. And we can stress ourselves into success. We can pressure ourselves into achievement. That is one way to become, again, really successful. One way to become very well liked. And like, you can do that. And a lot of people do. I mean, that's most, I think that that's the the thing that people do is they go out and they're trying to force it. They're really trying, because what do we, what have we grown up around? We've grown up around like, you know, it's willpower and you just, you, this is the way you're supposed to do it and follow these five easy steps. And you just show up every day. And even if it's painful, you know, no pain, no gain. And it's, it's, All of this. And then one thing to be clear about is that it's not a matter of like the absence of, of stress and pressure. Because right. I think even yeah, when, we oh, talk, yeah. when we talk about creating flow right. states, flow states exist really when your skills match the external kind of like forces or challenge that's there. So yeah. if you're not pushing yourself, right, you're not putting yourself on an edge, you don't tap into these peak states. And so it's, again, when you're doing the things that you enjoy, when you're challenging yourself, when you're like yeah. pushing your boundary, that that is the edge. That's where we find the most fulfillment. And so it's not to say that when you are living life in this way, that it is devoid of, of challenge. No, it, it should be because you can push yourself while still doing things that you enjoy. Wow. And that you really kind of are, are lit up by. I mean, that is amazing. And now I totally understand why. I, I've, I've been interviewing people, a lot of different people who are connected to you yeah. before we finally had this interview. And so they reference you in a lot of different, in their books, in their interviews. And, uh, and, and almost always, and I mentioned this before, um, it has to do with you asking a question or bringing up something, making them think in a different way, yeah. you know, asking and asking a question. This comes up a lot. And so one of the questions I wanted to ask you is how, how do you ask better questions? You know, um, what's your process for that? Well, I would say that one of the easiest places to start here yeah. is to anchor into like why you are asking the question in the first place. So I don't think of, of questions as like, I don't, I don't seek to ask people questions. What I seek to do is to understand people on a deeper level. Okay. So that what makes sense? So yeah, if you think yeah. about that. So when you come to someone, it's like, what do I want to understand about you? Yeah. So like the questions are just feeding an underlying curiosity. And so one of the things that I say mm-hmm. is that curiosity is like a muscle. And the more that we flex it, the stronger it gets. And when we can I leverage agree. our yes. curiosity as a muscle, it's like for someone who, again, you know, used to deal with a great deal of social anxiety and inhibition in social situations, what I started to found is that as I was able to strengthen my curiosity, and I'm going to show you how to do that, um, I found that not only was I able to connect more deeply with other people, but I felt like I was able to contribute value in conversations. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people think of contributing value in conversations as saying the witty thing, saying the smart thing. And I completely disagree. It's that I think that a question that is really helping someone else to explore part of themselves that they don't necessarily think about a lot Mm -hmm. uh, is super valuable for them, but also insightful and allows me to learn as a question asker. And so it's such a a powerful way to contribute value, not only in social situations, but in professional situations. If you are selling something Mm -hmm. or if you are a partner or you're working with your colleagues as a leader, if you can ask the question that allows someone to think about what they're doing in a powerful way to articulate what they need to do next, then you are going to be the most effective leader. You're going to be the person that people want to work with. And so what I say is seek to understand people. And there's one question that you can ask yourself before any meeting, before any social situation, before any date to do that. And it is, 
what do I most want to understand about the person I will meet? And so if I come here and I say to you, what do I most want to understand? I want to know what's your dream for all yeah. this. I want to know what's most exciting in your world. I oh, want yeah. to know what's what's most challenging right now. Where do you need help? I want to know what have been the biggest nuggets or like the most helpful pieces of insight. And so it's like, I can do that because I, I trained it now. Mm-hmm. But for a lot of people, they, they don't, they aren't capable of necessarily pulling out those questions right after that. But as you start to practice that and you just say, what do I want to know about this person? Then what you're doing is you're setting your, your curiosity compass. Mm-hmm. And that this is literally curiosity compass. Okay. That's, that's good. Bookmark. That's good. Yes. And, then, <laughs> and it's also the idea that, you know, one of my favorite ideas is, is the golden rule of question, which is that ask people the types of questions that you would want to be asked yourself. Mm-hmm. And so do you want mm-hmm. someone to ask you, what do you do? Where are no. you from? How do you, like yeah. those are pretty surface level, right? Right. But so if you want to go to a deeper level socially or at work, yeah. then you have to be the conversation catalyst. You have to be the one who's going there and asking those questions. And so that's basically one of the easiest ways that you can do that. And I think that to even to get started here is to ask yourself that question before these situations, making mm-hmm. sure that you're seeking to understand someone at a deeper level. And then a great process that I, I talk to a lot of people when I give them a presentation is the idea of setting your big five. Is like seeing what are the five questions. Okay. This is a little okay. Episode. The big five. The big five. Sorry. And so the big five are what are the questions that you are genuinely most excited to learn about people when you meet them. And you can do this socially, you can do it professionally, but what are the questions that do your curiosity justice? And because different people are interested about different things, but simply planting this into your psyche. So in any given moment, your default is able to transition from, so what do you do? Yeah. Right? So my my go to for years, I haven't had five, I haven't done the five. So I'm really excited to actually yeah. do this. Um, and I mean, I don't, I don't know if we're going to do it now, but later at some point, the sure. five, like I'm doing this, but, but um, my go-to is what's your passion? Cause I'm always interested in finding out what is the most, like, what's the thing that's really lighting people up. Totally. You know? And so I've, I found in, is passion is that oh, different ways to say that. I think it's like, what are you excited about right yeah. now? It's yeah. what do you, what do you do for fun? Is yeah. sometimes you, remember? Um, you know, sometimes people have trouble articulating the dream. And so I'd say, mm-hmm. like, if you knew you could not fail, what would you do? Yeah. You know, some different ways to package that um, is fun. But I think that, so that's the kind of work that I think about with curiosity. And I think that it is, again, it's, it is a muscle and it's something you need to train to be able to effectively bring that into conversations. But the things that I, I said, again, is kind of like the foundational truth to accept about questions yes. is that if you are asking more, if you're spending more time asking questions and listening than mm-hmm. talking, you're usually going to leave a good impression on yeah. your counterpart. They're going to appreciate that. They're going to feel heard. And then on top of that, for the most part, if you are speaking, mm-hmm. it's because you already know these things, right? Mm-hmm. It's any time that you're listening, you're probably learning something new. And so if you think about what's more valuable for how you want to live your life, it's like, well, if I kind of know these things that I'm talking about, I enjoy doing it with you. It's yeah. fun for me to do it because I care about these we're sharing with new people. Yeah. But also it's like when I get to sit down and I get to talk to your husband, yeah. I'm learning new things about the world. And that's a value of mine is learning and growth. And so questions line up with that. So anytime you're asking questions, you're probably learning and growing Mm -hmm. and you're making your counterpart feel valued. So it's a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. It's a great place to start. I love that. Well, okay. So we've talked about the the group and we've talked a little bit about community, which I want to, I want to go back to definitely because with associations, you know, they're always struggling with trying to figure out a way to to provide value Mm -hmm. and to show it's more than just perceived value. It's, it's, you know, a lot of times they get lost in, in thinking that they're like for profits that you guys feel like, you know, you have to be like for profits and constantly charging ahead, charging ahead. But the thing that makes us different, right, as associations is that the people are really where the resource is, is really where the value is. It comes back to the people that make up that organization. And so community is so, so, so important. For you, I want to talk about the importance of story too, Mm -hmm. right? Then storytelling, because, you know, um, with Tribute, I was looking at that and you work with a lot of organizations um, because you're capturing stories. And can can you tell me a little bit about how that started and what your approach is with with Tribute? So so Tribute was started um, in the summer of 2011, no, 2000 and... Gosh, it's been 2014. 
Um, so I walked into my apartment on my 27th birthday and it was uh, making I had gone to dinner. And then as I opened my door, I see like 30 pairs of strange shoes in the ground. I'm like, what's happening right now? And it's like <laughs> countdown, three, two, one, all my friends jump out, this big surprise party. And then halfway through the event, uh, Mickey basically just like, all right, everybody in the living room. So she gathers everyone in the living room just like this. Oh my gosh. Uh, and then she puts this video on the wall. I'm like, what's happening? She's like, just wait. And so she hits play. And then one after one, um, these videos start to come on the screen. And what I did not know is that Mickey reached out to my 25 closest friends and family members and asked them all to submit a one minute video telling me why they love me. And so now, oh my gosh, I sat here that's as amazing. My mother came on the screen telling me how proud oh. she's my dad, telling me he loved me. Tell like, me you cried. Oh, well, you yeah. had so to cry. <laughs> there was a third video. I would have been like, oh, my friend, yeah. My friend Matt called me his best friend for the first time. And I also felt that, but I hadn't articulated it. And that was the moment when I started crying. And I cried for 20 minutes straight because it was oh so powerful. My gosh. So I come out of this experience and I'm just I'm thinking to myself, this is the best gift I've ever received. Yeah. And so I go from there, I look at Mickey. I was like, how did you create this? And she looks me square in the eyes and she says, well, it sucked. <laughs> and I was like, it's like, it was horrible. And I was but... like, what do you mean? She, well, she was like, I had to send hundreds of emails. I had to collect all these files through Dropbox Drive, text message, you name it. And I walked into the other room and within 60 seconds, I was like, this is, I, I want to bring this to the world. I, I was like, you. it should not be this difficult to create the most meaningful gift on earth. And so what started is this mission to just spread these gratitude filled montages to bring people together, to give them that, that experience of just real deep love and self-worth, which I experienced and, and have carried with me every single day since. And so it started as a little mission. I got an incredible co-founder. We raised, you know, about like $1.5 million and it started as a consumer thing. But then what we saw is a lot of companies, a lot of corporations yeah. and even associations started using this for employee birthdays, for yeah. retirement parties. And I was like, oh, well, that's really cool. And for me, I've always run smaller companies, like sub 10 people, nonprofits and for profits. Yeah. And so it's a lot easier to just appreciate people. There's closer relationships. And as we started to do this, I was working with human resource officers and learning more about the idea of like an employee recognition program, which was something that was somewhat new to me. And then I started to realize that this is a $40 billion industry of employee rewards and recognition and all this software. And I realized that as we looked even deeper, that the number one reason that people leave their jobs in America is because they don't feel appreciated. Oh, wow. That's a Gallup poll in 2014. And then there's all these other stories about, you know, companies who have engagement programs who have 70% higher or recognition programs, 70% higher engagement. And it's the number one influence on your employees is going to be their relationships with their peers. And so we built this other tribute platform that's purely for employee recognition. So, you know, now you have, I'll never forget the day that, you know, this, this company in the Midwest gave this tribute to this woman who was retiring after 35 years. She sent us an email the next day and it said, um, thank you so much for this gift. And the last words of that email is something that I, I still remember to this day. And it said, I didn't know they cared this much. And I was like, wow. 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 And I said, 35 years of your life, you're going to spend 30% of your life where you work. You're going to spend more time with your coworkers and your bosses than your family. That's and a, she didn't know. And, 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 it's that, a, and these right. people loved her. They it's value bad. her so much. And it's just, again, it's that we have this barrier within us to sharing appreciation, to sharing gratitude, because we think it's a sign of weakness, because we think it's vulnerable, when all of the research says it is the exact opposite. When we share appreciation, we strengthen our bonds with other people. Yeah. And so uh, we just want to make it easier. And that's so much of this mission is how do we build technology and also just communication tools that show people that if you have anything nice to say, say it all. There's no reason to keep it inside. That's that's um, transformative. It's really interesting because I'm thinking about, I'm actually thinking right now, we probably have, a, have to have another conversation um, about this because I recently did something with association chat where I, I want to do something that is about why associations matter. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people in the association world, they go to their family holidays and stuff and nobody understands what it means to work for an association. Sure. I work for an associate. What does that mean? You know, and they can try to explain it. Nobody understands. And yet um, there are people who are doing just amazing work and they're, they're, you know, but it's something that a lot of people can't appreciate 
And yet they know that there's incredible meaning in what they're doing. Totally. And so um, invited people to come and they got their, but they got a headshot and they submitted a story. They submitted cool. why associations matter. Right. Yeah. And it was about, they shared stories about why, why they mattered to them. Right. Yeah. And so I, I put this out and it's on associationchat.com. But um, just did this in March, just did this for the first time last month and heard from people who said, can you do this in my city? Yeah. And this is in DC, but that was, it would be amazing to get where people were. I'm looking over here guys, because my husband's over here and I'm like, Hey, <laughs> it'd be really cool to get like um, video where people are sharing, where people are sharing their stories. Well, so I can if, see that. Yeah. If anyone wants to use it. So if you just go to tribute.co, you can find it. And we have a testimonial collection portal. So it's literally, it's just $25 to start one of these pages. And that's amazing. Collect these videos for any organization, any campaign. Okay. Like that. That's amazing. Yes. That's, that's actually really cool. And this was not planned. Oh, I'm just saying that like, that's, that's kind of neat. Yeah, totally. Yes. Well, I think, I think it's, again, it's, you know, the power of, of associations is again, it's community. And just like you said, it's an opportunity, not just to learn from one another, but to connect with people who have a shared passion. Yeah. I think that again, it's people who work in associations. They oftentimes they just they get to work with people. They get to support people, and there's a real shared purpose in that. And so, you know, and so much of what we've been talking about, I think that the real opportunity as association leaders that you have is to facilitate more meaningful conversations. And at Tribute, every one of our tributes that started mm -hmm. is centered around a prompt. And okay. that prompt is either, "What do you love about this person? What's your favorite memory?" What do you admire about them? What have you learned from them? That's so cool. And when you simply offer a prompt, you make it easier for an entire group to share something meaningful. It's you normalize that type of meaningful conversation. And so whether that's an attribute for an employee's birthday party for mm -hmm. a retirement celebration, or even at like your annual conference, right. whatever that might be. It's, you know, one of my, one of my most popular keynotes is it's called the art of meaningful conversation. And what I oftentimes do is I'll go into these conference events and what we will do is we'll talk about the art of meaningful conversation. We'll talk about social flow, how to feel confident, granted to that internal forces that you can control. But most importantly is we just set a couple of prompts. And so mm -hmm. these will be three questions. And let's say, guys, we're here for three days with some of the smartest people in our industry. Oh, no more. What do you do? Where are you from? Yeah. Let's talk about what's most challenging right now. Right. Let's talk about like, what do you need right now? What have you learned that's been most helpful to you? Because that's what everyone wants to talk about. Yeah. Everyone wants to talk about what they're learning. What's like, what's the biggest like development in your company right now? What's most exciting for you? And then what happens is that you give people permission to go a layer deeper and they all want that. And so for association leaders that, that have that initial buy-in of people who want to be a part of this group, it's when you give them permission to go a layer deeper, what's going to happen is not only are you going to facilitate deeper connections, but what's going to happen is that now the conversations that people are having away from the stage is all going to be correlated back to you. Because when you have your attendees who are sharing their best insights with everyone else, the amount of knowledge that people are getting at your event is going to 10x. Yeah. And that's what I think is so powerful is that it's not just the speakers now. It's every single attendee is empowered to share their best insights to learn from one another. And that's one of the most powerful things that an association leader can do. I love, okay. So, I mean, obviously people need to reach out to Andrew. To find out. <laughs> like, I mean, seriously, that would be a great way to kick off the, it's because, because why have all the noise and waste your time with the weather here has been like, you know, it's a little hazy and muggy and, and why can't you just get to the good stuff? Right. Everybody wants to really know this stuff and connect, have meaningful connections. But we're also scared, right? Totally. We're also scared. And you're saying, yeah, no, let's let's figure out how to engage with each other in a way that really means something. Totally. It's it's what's important to me and what I want and allowing yourself to go there. Yeah. And it's again, and, and, and if you are in a position where you say it's like, well, what if the other person doesn't want to go there? Then that's okay. That's yeah. not about you. That's about that's them. About them. Yeah, but that's your right. Your responsibility is yeah. to be true to what's important to you, what's meaningful, what's honest, what's, you know, and as long as we're doing this in a container of being compassionate and kind, that's fine. But, you know, when we understand what's important to us and we give ourselves to that, we were just so much less needy. Mm -hmm. People will feel that in conversation. So speaking of needy, my daughter over here, <laughs> <laughs> she needs to come on. I, I said, I want to give her a chance. To, while we while we have the yeah. opportunity to and I never you guys know if you watch um, or listen to any association chat interviews 
I never really had this opportunity, but we're here, we're in your home. I wanted to give her an opportunity to ask her own question. So come on in, Margo. In. Let's do Margo's it. 11 and this is her spring break. And so, so what's your question? So if I want to be successful when I grow up doing this, what could I do? Hmm. I think that the most effective thing that people can tap into to be successful um, is to understand how they want to help people is that I think that the most sustainable source of motivation and a real sense of purpose is understanding how you want to help people. And I think that like for me, when I was younger and I didn't really have a sense of purpose or, or confidence, where I found my own sense of worth and excitement in life was seeing where I could help people. And for me, that started with helping young kids with disabilities to play sports because I, mm. I love sports and there were kids who didn't have access to these types of opportunities, you know? And then as I became more proficient in, in communication, I got to help people with that kind of stuff. And so I would say that to be successful in all these things, it's connecting to service and understanding that if you want to feel good, help someone else feel good. And if that's your anchor is just drawn back into service that You'll, you'll have the motivation to get better and to do things. You'll have a sense of purpose and a sense of real value. And that, that is ultimately the sense of worth that ruminates out into confidence, into real connection, um, and into real success for me. Because to me, success, like, which is the word that you use, is not about achievement. It's not mm. about material things. It's not about a, a number in my bank account. It's about, like, do the people that I care about love me back? And have, I, have right. I left the world a little better than when I got here? And so that's what I'd say is connect to how you want to help people. This is a good that's one. Good one. It's a good one. It's a good question, question, Margo. So how do you like helping people? Uh, I like helping people by... Um... <laughs> now, let me think about how I'm successful. <laughs> <laughs> well you well you're you are a dancer so you can you probably like entertain people how do you like how do you, do you ask your friends questions do you like checking on how they are well when <laughs> when i'm at school um sometimes when i see somebody who feels down like even if they're like not my friend or something i'll check in and see how they're doing yeah and how do you feel when you do that? I feel a lot happier because I usually get them to feel um, happy if they're not happy. Yeah. And it's like I, I say so often, I'm a big advocate for, for mandatory service learning in schools. And I think that being able to introduce young people to meaningful service learning events where they get to go and actually connect to others is so powerful. Mm -hmm. But just that that experience of remembering is one of the most powerful things that you can give young people and something you really committed to. Great oh question, Margo. Yay! Yay! Okay, so I want to see if I have time for one more. I guess I can ask, I'll ask one more question if you'll, if you'll let me. I'm in. Okay. So, um, you know, oh my gosh, we have had such an amazing time talking and uh, covering so much, so much ground. But what I haven't had a chance to ask you yet is, so what about the future? Mm. I mean, so do you have, you have some really great things that are um, happening right now. Do you have, I don't know, any vision that you want to share with us on where things are headed? Yeah. You know, what's been beautiful about, I, I really do subscribe to a lot of the stuff that I talked about. And for me, you know, I'm, I'm now 32 mm -hmm. and I have found the most contentment and joy in my life when I've really started to do the things that I've talked about of mm -hmm. I'm, I'm doing all the things that I've said in my life that I want to do of having my own podcast with, with New York Times bestseller. Yes, congratulations, so by the way. I'm of, so excited for you. Of writing a book, of, yeah. of having a technology yes. company. And, you know, all these things could be bigger, could be more successful. I could be making more money. I'm making enough to honor my responsibilities and to support a family and do these things. But I, I really just made an effort to just say like, I'm doing the things that I want to be doing. Mm -hmm. And hopefully I'll have more time to give more into these things. But, you know, everything that I, I, I think a great question to ask yourself is like, what aren't you doing that you'd like to be? Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm in a place where I'm very blessed to 
to be actualized in that way. Like I'm doing all these things, you know, I, I see a tangible impact in the people I get to work with through the Junto, through tribute testimonials every single week. And so yeah. I'm really content. But in terms of how this continues to scale, you know, there is there's even more joy in, you know, as more people get impacted by the work of the book and social mm -hmm. flow as you know, more people get to hear the presentation and drop into meaningful dialogues at, at conferences, um, you know, tributes launching the app later this year that's going oh, to focus so cool. on one-to-one -one, uh, messages on birthdays through video and stuff like oh, that. Oh, really yeah. So I want to sign up for that immediately. So it's just, it's like, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's um, just continuing to live like this way. It's not even a matter of more, but it's just continuing to focus on what really matters and allowing myself to be grounded and guided by what's important to me. And, um, yeah, that's, that's really the path forward for me. Well, this has been... A great pleasure. I am so excited that I, I got it. a chance to talk with you and um, to be introduced to your home and your family. And I look forward to more conversations in the future. We will make it happen. All right. This is great. Thank good. you for asking such awesome questions and bringing your great family yeah, yeah, into the yeah. Moroccan den. So long. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of Association Chat. If you like it, please subscribe or better yet, tell a friend. You can join the Association Chat book club or support Association Chat by visiting Association Chat's Patreon site. You can also find more information about live events, private communities, special projects, and more on associationchat.com. See you next time. Hey, Association Chat is in its 10th year and independently owned and produced by me, Kiki Letalien, and a very small crew of freelancers and volunteers. We appreciate our sponsors like you wouldn't believe. So I want to give a special thanks to all of our sponsors. Today, that includes Boulder, Event Waves, and Amplified Growth. Thanks to all of you. And if you want to find out more about sponsorship, then go to associationchat.com or email me kiki at amplifiedgrowth.net and we'll be happy to talk with you. All right. Thanks.